This one, this right here, beta three equals beta one. We're now going to take, do it with the other set of equations that we haven't manipulated yet. We're going to take five and six and plug it into uh, four. Uh, some more small angle approximation that we're doing. So we have in theta three equals theta four. And so equation five is an equation, it's theta four, so that's equal to alpha two plus theta two. And theta three is beta two plus gamma. And no doubt you can see where this is going. The excitement is building. Did I say beta 2 or 3? Uh, there is no beta 3, so probably a 2. Okay. We're talking right here? No, in the parentheses. Uh, yeah, that's a 2. Okay. That's coming from this right here. Oh, okay. Alright. Alright, I now have these two equations and I want to combine them somehow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve, I'm going to go ahead and distribute here. So this is n beta 1 minus n gamma. And then I'm going to solve for n gamma. Uh, so that becomes n beta 1 minus alpha 1 minus beta 1. And then make sure that, okay. Down here, I'm going to go ahead and distribute over here. So that's n beta 2 plus n gamma. And hey, I now have a formula for n gamma. I'll plug that straight into there. So I have alpha 2 plus beta 2 equals n beta 2 plus n beta 1 minus alpha 1 minus beta 1. Make sure I don't have a sign in the wrong spot and have to backtrack. All right, we're good there. At this point, I want to get the alphas on one side and betas on the other. So uh, let's get alphas over on the left hand side. So I got my alpha here, and let's get this beta over on the right hand side. Since I'm adding and subtracting, I just do the opposite to get it over to the other side. And so this becomes alpha 1 plus alpha 2 on the left hand side and on the right hand side n beta 2 plus n beta 1 minus beta 2 minus beta 1 rearranging a little bit we got n beta 2 minus beta 2 plus n beta 1 minus beta 1 Doing a little factoring here, I can factor parts of that and parts of that. So that's beta 2 n minus 1 plus, over here, beta 1 n minus 1, which can then be factored one more time as in beta 2 plus beta 1 times n minus 1. So that huge mess comes down to this, this somewhat simplified formula here. In order to simplify it one step further, we're going to, of course, do some more small angle approximations. And it's not unreasonable to do that because if you think about images going through a lens, you know, think about your eyesight for the couple of us who wear glasses here, that we're looking at things far away. I'm not looking using my lens to look at something that's this close. 
And actually, for me, I have to take my glasses off when it's that close. Questions before we near the end? And I know it's going to be a sad moment when the, we finally finish with the derivation. But we need to do it. So I'm now left with alpha 1 plus alpha 2 equals beta 1 plus beta 2 times n minus 1. This is just a recap of what we got to there. All right, so uh, we don't need the original formulas anymore. So I'm going to erase those. They have served their purpose. All right, so let's take a look at this right triangle. This from P to A and then straight down and over. So we're basically having a right triangle there. Let's see if I can highlight it in a pink that hopefully will show up here. And we're looking at this triangle right here. That is a right angle there. What's the tangent of alpha 1? Looking at that pink right triangle, what is the tangent? And if indeed this is a small angle here, we're dealing with an object that's far enough away, that's approximately equal to alpha 1 using the small angle approximation. Convenient. So we can make a substitution on here. The tangent of alpha 2, looking at, we'll do the other. Sure, why not? Let's do pink again. What's the tangent of alpha 2? H3 to be alpha. And again, if we assume small angle. Now, it's not a small angle the way I've drawn it here, but that's also a really huge lens. If, yep, one more approximation. If the lens is thin enough, then H1 is approximately H3. Because it doesn't have far to go. It's not like it enters it, typical things like glass or, or water or things that we deal with on a regular basis. It's not like it hits those things and does a really sharp turn here. Uh, I've drawn it more exaggerated than probably actually is. But if the lens is thin, then these two different heights really aren't going to be the same, because even if it does take a sharp turn, it doesn't have far to go. So I'm just going to set those equal to h. And so therefore, alpha 1 is equal to h over the object distance. Alpha 2 is equal to uh, h over the image distance. We're going to do a similar process, except we need to somehow bring in the, the radii. Uh, so, so if I look at, so we did this pink triangle right here, P, A, and then right below it. I'm going to use that same leg, the, the height there, and purple. And this time I'm doing it from C, so I'm doing that really is not showing up particularly well. Yellow, that would be. Let's try red. That is also sad. So looking at that new pinkish triangle.
There we go. That's showing up. So looking at that pink triangle, or red triangle, uh, what is the sine of theta 1? And then from that small angle approximation, beta 1 is approximately equal to h over r1. Uh, doing the other triangle here, where from this red triangle, from E to D to h3. Sign of beta 2. Say it again. H1 over R2. Not H1. H3. Okay. Unless, of course, you're going with, they're roughly the same. So, But officially, H3 over R2, which is beta 2 is approximately H over R2. We're now ready to plug into here. So I have h over the object distance plus h over the image distance equals h over r1 plus h over r2 times n minus 1. Every term is going to have an h if we multiply it all out. So h goes away. And what we are finally left with in the end is 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance. Now, if we're dealing with focal length, that would be equal to 1 over the focal length, but that's equal to 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2 times n minus 1. And that is the lens maker's equation. The only difference between this and the book version of it is the book uses p for the object distance and uses q for the image distance. Questions before we do an example. As an example for this, uh, I want to do problem because it's 36.33. Uh, and one thing to point out on this particular problem from the textbook is they left one piece of information out. They now talk about what the material is that the lens is going into. Uh, the problem as stated So 36, 33, the first surface of a thin lens has a convex radius of 20 centimeters. So we're saying this, basically this radius right here, if we, the radius is 20 centimeters. From that, we can figure out what is the focal length. If that's the radius, what's the focal length? Assuming the other side were symmetric. What's the relationship between radius of curvature and focal length for a thin lens? They're the same. Pardon? They're the same. They are not. Same is true for a mirror. Two times. 
So yes, so the fourth point would be food. By the way, oh, okay. Did, yeah, ten centimeters. Focal length is halfway oh, between the radius and the curve. All right. So they tell us the first side is twenty centimeters. Uh, what should the radius of the second surface be to produce a converging lens of focal length eight centimeters? Um, So we want a focal length total of eight centimeters. So what does this side need to be? Well, I know one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is equal to one over the focal length. And one over the object distance plus one over the image distance is equal to n minus one times one over r1 plus one over r2. The lens maker's formula or equation, I think I flip back and forth between what I call it. So we want this to be eight centimeters, so one over eight is equal to 1.5 minus one. Uh, it does need to be 1.5, they don't state that in the problem, but that's the way that you get the answer they give. One over 20 plus one over R2. And so now it's a math problem solving for R2. So this becomes one eighth is equal to 0.5 times one twentieth plus one over R2. Divide both sides by 0.5, and we get 0.25 equals 0.05 plus 1 over R2. Subtract, so 1 over R2 is equal to 1 over, uh, sorry, is equal to 0.2, otherwise known as 1 fifth. So R2 would be 5 centimeters. Again, the 10 centimeters we said earlier for the focal length is if the two sides of the curve uh, were the same. I'm sorry, where, where did the 1.5 come from? Uh, the index of refraction, that in order to get the answer they give in the book, the index of refraction has to be 1.5. Okay. Uh, that's roughly equal to the data class. So they don't, again, they don't state that in the problem, that's a mistake in the book, but that has to be, it's given. How did you do your math after, uh, yes, what? From here to here? Yeah. All right, so uh, divide, I want to get rid of the 0.5, so I multiply both sides by two. So that, the one half of the two will cancel out. Two times one eighth is one fourth, and one fourth is 0.25. What I'm left now with is 1 20th plus one over, so I'm left with one fourth is equal to one twentieth plus one over R two, and I just decimals made sense to me at that moment. I know that's point two five, and that's point oh five plus one over R two, and then subtract point oh five from both sides. Point two is equal to one over R two, and I know point two is one fifth. So two tenths. And so when I flip it at the end to get my R2, uh, my two tenths becomes 10 seconds. Five. Other questions in the remaining however many seconds we have? And I know this class was a dream come true. Nothing but derivations. Yes. Perhaps we'll do it again sometime. And on that note, see you tomorrow. The lab is posted for tomorrow. It's uh, you'll be the first group ever to do this lab. Uh, so we look forward to the experiment. We get an experiment. What you're going to be excluded you doing is put a large mirror right there. Four different ways of finding the radius of curvature of that large mirror.
Zach.